We're starting a new series today called Home. Somebody say Home. 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 How many of you are glad to be home? You call Overflow Home. Come on. How many are glad that the kingdom of God is your home more than this earth is? And so we're going we're, we're gonna to be digging into the story of the prodigal son, what many call the prodigal son. Today will be the last time that we refer to him as the prodigal son because he's not prodigal anymore. He's been found and he's home now. And so in, in Luke chapter 15... There is a story of three lost things. First of all, there's a lost sheep, and many of us know this parable. There's a lost coin, and there's the parable of the lost son. Neither of those things are lost anymore. They've all been found. And we are going to be spending this series today talking about where we come from, what a prodigal looks like. His story will end as a prodigal and begin as a son starting next week. We're going to be talking about our identity, what it looks like when you come home. And there are a lot of visuals that were given in this parable uh, about this son that came home and what he came home to. And a lot of times we just focus on what we used to be, but I, I'm here to tell you and equip you for who you are now. And so that's what we're going to be doing in this series. So Luke chapter 15, if you got your Bible, this is, this is a very... A very familiar passage. In fact, the world even knows this story a lot of times. And, uh, and I, I want you, my, my job is to reprogram you from calling this the story of the prodigal son. It is not the story of the prodigal son anymore. Today will be the last time again that we refer to it that. Luke chapter 15. A man had two sons. The younger son, widow butter, said to his father, I want to share in your estate now before you die. How many know that's not the way inheritance are supposed to work? So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And a few days, few days later, his younger son picked up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. Remember that. He's in a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. Verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, Self, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father. I'll go home to my father. And say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. He didn't just go home to provision and a warm bed and to work the land and to take up his responsibilities. No, he returned home to dad, to his papa, to his father. So we, we see several things, several stages in the prodigal's journey. First of all, the prodigal had a pursuit. And his pursuit was independence and freedom. Rebellion always is rooted in freedom. That's what we call it, at least. We think that somehow, if I can be on my own, if there are no rules, I can do whatever I want, I'll be independent, I don't need anybody. 
How many of you were raised maybe in a home like that? I don't need anybody else. Some people live their walk with the Lord like that. I don't need anybody. It's just me and you need other people. In fact, usually what God has for you is in the hands of somebody else. And he thought that he wanted to pursue happiness and that meant his independence, no rules, no regulations, no standards, no dad to tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want to do. And he does this by going to his father and asking him for something. He's not really completely independent. He goes to his dad, he says, I want you to give me what belongs to me. Essentially what he's saying, and it's so absurd, essentially what he's saying is, dad, you're dead to me. Give me my money. And what's interesting is it's not really even that much because he's the younger son. The the older son got about two thirds of the inheritance and the younger son only got about a third. Now it was a lot. I mean, you know, a little is a lot when you have nothing. And he had, he actually had everything, but he also had nothing. He had nothing on his own. Everything that he had belonged on at home. But he was saying, I want a portion so I can do my own thing, so I can live my best life, so I can do whatever I want. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to be independent. I'm a grown man. He chose independence over access. I want to tell you today that at home, there's everything that you need. And most of what you'll want. It's at home. But many people will choose independence to have what they can call their own. And this is kind of the American dream. We've programmed people to not need anybody else. Entitlement. We got to have the inheritance to get there. So he could... And he could, he could, he could get by on his own for a minute. For a minute, he could get by on his own. He, he, could, he could buy whatever he wanted. He could spend his money however he wanted. And guess what he did? He spent it on whatever he wanted. The older brother later refers that he, he says that he spent his money on prostitutes. He spent his money on wild living. Whatever he wanted to do, he moved to a distant land and he, to this place of Gentiles where there were no standards. There was no law to keep. There was no dad to tell me. There was no conscience to keep. All there was is I do whatever my flesh wants to do. Whatever my libido wants to do, I'll do it. I got the money for it. And a father who knows the, the mess that he will be in, a father who desires personal freedom over control gives his son this new lease on life. And he goes far away. So his pursuit is happiness. His pursuit is independence. His pursuit is freedom. At least that's what he thinks it is. And, and secondly, is we find that his proximity is in a distant place. And the most troubling thing about this story is not the wild living, it's the proximity. He moved to a distant place. He moved to a place that was not his home. He moved to a place where he could provide for himself a place free of his, the, the standards he was raised in. Different customs, different practices. Listen, it's easy to to define him as a prodigal because he was indulging in wild living. And that's what prodigals do. That is what prodigals do. But what defines him as a prodigal is the distance. It's the distance that he put between him and his father. See, a lot of times we have distance with God and we blame him for the distance. But we're the ones that move away. We're the ones that decide we're going to do our own thing and go to a distant place to enjoy things that we were never meant to enjoy. And our father knew that if we enjoyed those things long enough, eventually they become our demise. But the prodigal's demise was the distance. This is where he got messed up. 
It was the distance. What's, what's terrifying is many people are living in distance and think they're still good with the Father. And they're, and they're so far from God. They say, well, I pray. And I talk to God. And God said, I, I, I tell you what, I could just live the rest of my life without seeing another social media post that says God says, and it's not something that is clear that the scripture said that God says is something they retweeted. I'm not talking about what Twitter says. I'm talking about what God says. And in order to know what God says, you have to be in proximity to know what God is saying. You don't know what God says by living in a distant land. You know what God says is by living at home. Maybe you might have the Bible memorized, but you don't have the heart of it because you don't have the Holy Spirit because you've moved out of the house. You've moved far away. And so the great demise is the distance. And his distance leads to his predicament. And his predicament that he's finding himself in is not independence and freedom. It's actually bondage. And it's hell on earth. This is what he's experiencing. Verse 13, he wasted all his money on wild living. And about that time, all the money ran out. What are you doing with your inheritance? What are you doing with the life that God has given you? I've I've heard it said that the the life that we have is the gift that God gives us. The breath that we have, that we live out and we live our our, our dealings and we do all the stuff with this, this lease that God has given us on our life and we go out and we live it however we want. But I've also heard it said this way, is God is the one that gives us life. That is God's gift to us and how we live that life as our gift back to God. And here he is in this predicament experiencing hell on earth because his money runs out and then a famine hits the land. And I want to tell you, the famine is coming. You say, oh, is that a pollution? No, no, the the famine is coming and the the famine is here. You are going to have seasons where it is dry and the environment that you're in is not producing. You're going to experience those seasons. You're going to experience those seasons where you pray and it feels like nobody's listening. You're going to experience those seasons that might feel like decades where you're like, when am I going to get breakthrough? I mean, hell is coming. And the purpose of hell coming is to take you out. I'm going to use the word hell quite a bit today. I hope you're okay with that because the Bible uses it quite a bit. So the famine's coming. And when the famine comes, all the food goes away. And he began to starve. I mean, that's a bad place to be. I mean, he is starving so much that he's looking at at the, the stuff that he's feeding the pigs. And he thinks it looks good to eat. And he, he can't even eat that. But no one, he thought that looked appetizing, but he said no one gave him anything. He could, he could be at what we would call rock bottom. How many of y'all been on rock bottom before? Rock bottom is not the worst place to be. The worst place to be is dying on rock bottom. And for us, when we're on rock bottom, when you have a good father, rock bottom is never the end. You can always look up. So here he is, hungry. We don't know how long, weeks, days, months, starving. His his words, I'm starving, not like your eight-year-old that had a Twinkie. 10 minutes ago starving. No, for real. He's, he's irresponsible. Not only that, is he, he's thinking about what he wasted his money on. Can you imagine the remorse, the guilt, the shame? Man. I should not have went on that three-week binge. I'm going to be paying for that for a long time. Jesus says this in John 8, 34. He says, he who sins is a slave to sin. 
So he wasn't experiencing freedom. He was experiencing bondage. Freedom was at home. Freedom was getting everything he needed. Doesn't mean there wasn't any work involved. When you're home, you have responsibilities. But what he thought is, I can do whatever I want. But when you do whatever you want, according to what your flesh desires, you always end up in this place. Regret. Shame. Distant. So what he does is he persuades a local farmer. Now that word persuade there in the Greek, if you look at it, it actually means to be glued to. So basically what he does is he goes to this farmer and he says, I will be your servant. Just give me a bed. So he sends him into the fields. There's probably this little shack out there, some kind of tent for him to sleep in. And his job is to feed the pigs. And he gets this little place to live, to stay, a job to do. By the way, feeding pigs is erroneous for a Jewish boy. They're unclean. You're not even supposed to be around them. Thank God for the cross. I can smoke that pork butt and enjoy it. Yeah, baby. Come on. It's clean now. Come on. This is, this is before the cross. This is before the, before the cross when you couldn't have no bacon on your hamburger. I mean, come on. And so here he is. Uh, he wouldn't think of killing one of those pigs because he's Jewish, but here he is living with them. I mean, this is as low as it gets for someone of his value system. Yeah. The keeping of swine would have been prohibited in the Jewish law. And he's, he's not just serving this pagan rancher. He's serving pigs. This is, this is what his independence and this is what his freedom has led him to, serving pigs. It was all fun and games a couple months ago before I ran out of money and the famine hit. Yep. And here I am. Maybe I should have stayed home. And no one would give him anything and it was all his fault. He's experiencing hell on earth. When we talk about hell, we can talk about hell on earth, but did you know that Jesus, we don't talk about hell much in church nowadays. Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. In fact, over 70 times, Jesus referred to hell. Most of the time in a literal fashion. Not figurative. He's not being figurative. Oh, there's hell, hell on earth like we use it. No, no, he's talking about a literal hell, a hell that was created for the devil and his angels where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, there's regret, there's remorse. It's much deeper than starving to death with a bunch of pigs. It's eternal separation from God. It's not being in the low place saying, hey, I can go home one day. Maybe I'll go home one day. It's a, I'm gonna be here forever. Weeping, gnashing of teeth. Most of the times that Jesus talks about hell, he's talking about fire and brimstone. We don't like fire and brimstone preachers very much, but we like Jesus. Well, guess what? Jesus is a fire and brimstone preacher. Yep. Yeah. Especially to the religious. Yep. But hell, the ultimate hell, is the proximity The problem with hell is it's spiritual death. It's separation from God. Permanent. The problem with eternal hell is it's permanent hell. This is what Jesus speaks of. In Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But, <laughs> come on, there's good news. The gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. Not eternal death, it's eternal life through Christ Jesus. Jesus says this in John chapter 8, again, verse 24. Unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, I am, come on, God in the flesh. Unless you believe who I claim to be, I am, you will die in your sin. And if you don't trust Jesus... 
you will experience literal hell. But that's not where the gospel ends. The gospel doesn't end in a cold shack, in a pigsty with the stink. That's not where the gospel ends. Here's the prodigal, morally, emotionally, and socially bankrupt. But there was one little glimmer in his heart. He remembered home. He remembered home. When when he's talking about home, he's not talking about one day when I die. He's talking about something that I go, a place that I go to now, a proximity that is different than the proximity I am in now, a proximity that is close to the Father. Home is where the Father is. So when he finally comes to his senses, he says to himself, at home, the hired servants, the hired servants at home, I'm a a hired servant in a distant land, but at home, They have enough food to spare, but here I'm dying of hunger. And he begins to think about what he would say to dad when he gets home. I'll go to him and I'll I'll tell him, man, I, I blew it. I sinned against you. I sinned against heaven. Would you just, dad, would you... Would you, can I even call you that? Can I even call you dad? Will you just, will you just let me kind of come home and, you know, you can put me out back where all the servants live and I'll, I'll stay there. I don't have to have my old room back. I don't need my Xbox and all that. Just, just put me in the back. I know no more Twinkies. It's okay. I'll just, I'll just eat whatever they have. Just, just let me, because I'm just so hungry. I mean, his motivation is his hunger. It wasn't like, I love dad. His motivation is, I'm hungry, and I need my dad. Beloved, this is the beginning of understanding the gospel is that you need dad. You have a hunger that you can never fill. But dad's got plenty to fill your hunger. This is the most reasonable thought the prodigal had in a very, very long time. And where do you think that thought came from? I mean, he is not really one that has a lot of bright ideas. Jesus says in John 6, 44, he says, no one comes to the Father. No one comes home unless the Father draws them. In my imagination, I like to think that Dad would walk out on the porch at night and dream about his son and hope that he wasn't killed by animals or suffers an overdose. I like to think that he would go out inside and look in the distance and think maybe, maybe he'll hit rock bottom and maybe he'll come to his senses and maybe he'll come home today. I think like any father who lost his son would go out and call his name and cry out over the mountains and the valleys into the distant places Son, son, come on home. I know the famine's hard. I know, I know your character. You're probably not making good. You can come on home, ring the dinner bell. Can you hear me, son? Calling out in the distance. And I think at this moment that the son at rock bottom who has nothing else to distract him goes maybe I can go home maybe he heard something I don't know I like to think 
I like to think Papa would go out and, and, <laughs> and sing those songs they used to sing together when he was young. We'd call out into the distance. Hoping that he'll hear the voice and come to his senses. Hoping that Pops is good enough to just accept me as a hired servant. How do we go from hell to home? You come to your senses. For him, he didn't think his father was extravagantly good, but he did think his father was good enough. Good enough to let him live out back. He comes to his senses and repentance happens. Notice, notice the language. I will go to my father and say to him, I have sinned. Have you sinned? The answer is yes. You have sinned. All of us have sinned and gone astray. All of us. I don't care how you were raised or how well behaved you were in high school. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Second Corinthians 7.10, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. Your Bible might say godly sorrow leads to repentance. Many of us, what we do when we feel sorrowful about our sin is we say that's the devil. That's not the devil. That's the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you sin, you should have deep regret in that moment for how you've sinned. When you've looked at those pictures, when you've stayed on the scroll for too long, you should feel guilt and remorse for that. But let it be godly. Because we're not talking about shame. We're talking about godly sorrow, which leads to repentance. That's, listen, the goodness of God that leads to repentance is this. It's God speaking to you when you're sin and going, stop it. That's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Not just, oh, I just know God is so good, and so I'm going to stop sinning. Most people don't repent for that reason. They repent because they're desperate. And you are desperate because you have sinned. But there's a good, loving Father that gives you this gift of repentance that leads us from salvation, that leads us from sin and into salvation. There's no kind of, no regret for that kind of sorrow. Again, we're not talking about shame where you're continually reminding yourself of sin that you've already confessed to God. That is the devil. If you, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from, get this, all of it. Yeah. All unrighteousness. Yeah. Not just a little bit. All of it. Yeah. And he clothes you with a new righteousness. A righteousness that you could never earn. Yeah. We'll talk about that next week. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance. Other words, you just feel bad about it. Well, I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> I don't make good choices sometimes. <laughs> That's called making light of sin. The Bible calls that worldly sorrow. So if you feel bad about it, but not bad enough to change, that's worldly sorrow. That's not godly sorrow because you're not willing to change. And if that's all you have, that leads to spiritual death. That leads to hell. I believe godly sorrow is the draw of the Father. It's the Father going, I want you. That's inferior to what I have for you. Come on home. How do you go from hell to home? You come to your senses. I blew it. 
And number two, you humbly head home. What we see in the posture of this young man is that he is remorseful for the life that he's lived. He's remorseful for the distance. And I, and I want you to pay attention. He says, so I returned. So he returned home to his father while he was still a long way off. We see five acts, which we'll talk about next week. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Why did his father see him coming? Because Pops was out on the porch that day, and he was looking in the distance, and he sees a familiar figure in the distance. It's, it's, it's kind of scrawny and dirty, but it's someone walking. He's walking towards the house. He looks like he could use a meal, but he looks kind of familiar and I believe the father postures up maybe he's sitting on his rocking chair and he jumps up and he goes could it be could could today be the day could today be the day that my son comes home is that him is that him and he sees it he gets the glimmer in his eye he can see it's his son is it different he looks different than he did before but it's his son and the father gets up from his seat and he runs which is very inappropriate for a Jewish, an older Jewish man to do that. And he gets up and he runs up the road to the house and he sees his son and he grabs him and he pulls him in and his son starts to say, Father, I've sinned. He won't have any of it. He knows he's turned from sin, his dung-crusted face and his smelly clothes. His wasted inheritance, his wasted life, his distance living. And the father pulls him in and embraces him. Filled with love and compassion, he ran. He ran, embraced him, and kissed him. In the mess that he was in, he hadn't taken a bath. He hadn't changed his clothes, but he was embraced by the Father. And this is the gospel. All he wants was for you to head home. And you don't have to dot your I's and cross your T's and you probably got a lot of baggage and you're probably stinky and pretty dirty and you're not ready for the party, but the Father will give you what you need. See, the son went humbly. He was seeking mercy, and he found grace. And this is us when we come home. We're seeking mercy. Lord, forgive me. Just just give me enough to survive. And he goes, oh, I'll give you more than that. I'll give you more than that. You're my son. I'm glad you're alive. I'm glad you're here. The son had est- underestimated his ability to make it and survive without the father, but he greatly underestimated the love of his father. He greatly underestimated the grace of his father, the desire his father would have to wait for him to see him coming. See, the road is not simply a shift in behavior. The road is paved by Jesus. Jesus is the road that we head on. Jesus is the path to the Father. John 14, 6. They're like, Lord, show us the Father. And he's like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You don't want to know what the Father looks like? He looks like me. And then he says this, I'm the way. Jesus is the way to the Father. The Holy Spirit is is convicting you of sin. And Jesus provides a way for you to come home. And our story ends with one man named a prodigal. His story ends, but his new story begins because he's not a prodigal anymore. He's not a sinner anymore. He's not despised by God. He's not a joke of the Father's community and servants anymore. He's home. He's here. He's son. He's found. 
Have you been found? Have you been rescued by God? The Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, he says that you were dead in your sin. And because your sinful nature was not cut away, he said this, but God made you alive. He said you were dead. And the resurrection comes to give you resurrection. God made you alive in Christ for he forgave all your sins. Jesus said this, the purpose of the Son of Man, he, he said this to Zacchaeus who was a, considered a sinner by everyone. He said this, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to affirm the lost. He came to rescue the lost. Thank you for joining us at Overflow Church today. We hope that you are encouraged and encountered the reality of Jesus. If you did, please let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything that we have coming up. Have a great day.